Hello and welcome back to Open Source Workplace Interview Series. Uh, today I'm here with Frank Cottle, uh, an experienced entrepreneur, uh, and we're looking to dive into the conversations with him. But for anyone who is here for the first time, um, I want to welcome you. Um, I want you to sort of like, subscribe, uh, hit that bell, and if, if some sort of thoughts or questions that you have come up through this conversation, then you know, make a note be below and uh, Frank and I will be sure to get back to you and sort of provide you with insights and sort of uh, follow up uh, if there's anything here that we captured today that you have further questions on. So, uh, as I said, I'm here with Frank Hall. Frank, it's great to see you again. Uh, good to see you too, Steve. Good, good, good. Um, so, so tell us all about yourself. Uh, you know, you're, you're obviously a, a serial entrepreneur. Everyone knows you from your Alliance brands, but uh, you did a little bit of thing before, before Alliance that I thought were very interesting. Maybe the viewers would like to hear about. Oh, uh, well, uh, as you can tell from my gray hair or lack of it, uh, I've, I've, I've had a few years of experience. Uh, uh, I actually started my career as a commercial diver. Uh, working as a contractor to one of our federal agencies during the end of the Vietnam era. Uh, and uh, moved on from there into the yacht and shipping uh, area, uh, raced uh, big yachts for lots of years and uh, got to hang out with a whole bunch of people that have a lot more money than I'll ever have, which was fun. Uh, but also learned quite a bit about how business is done. And we built what was then the largest yacht brokerage in the world. So it wasn't all fun. Uh, but it was a, a great, great start to a career. And I, I, I had a, a sort of an epiphany at, at the end of, of my, my sojourn there, uh, that as long as I was a broker, I'd never be an owner. And in thinking through that process, I, I, I became dissatisfied and sold out my position in the firm and started uh, what is our current uh, or the predecessor firms to the Alliance Group uh, today. And that was back in 1980. Uh, 79, 80 period. So uh, we've been in the serviced office industry now for 40 years, uh, starting as a property company for 10 years and then selling that portfolio and migrating to an operating company uh, in, in between uh, 1990 and 2000. And, uh, we were the largest private operator of business centers in the world, myself and two partners at that time. And uh, we sold that portfolio. Uh, and then today we're a business services and technology model. Uh, we decided uh, we'd rather own the, uh, the customers than own the centers. Uh, so we've gone to, uh, basically, we'd rather be Expedia than Hilton, uh, if you think through that, that business model. And that's our position today. We have uh, almost 1,100 facilities now uh, in our network structure, uh, operating in 54 countries. Uh, so we're quite, uh, quite broadly based. Uh, and today we also invest uh, quite a bit in other companies within the industry, primarily in the prop tech sector. Uh, and so we've been growing in that, that regard as well. Wow, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, there uh, Frank. Um, so if, if I had to go back and sort of, you said you had an epiphany, was there was there a single moment or was it sort of you saw oh, it, it was absolutely behavior it was a moment uh, 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 I won't name names but there was a, a elderly gentleman in our firm about my age same as I'm my age now and he was making this awful whiny begging sales presentation to one of his best clients uh, who just didn't want to act and I looked at him and his name's Frank also. I looked at him and I thought, oh my God, I've known this guy all my life. I, his, his nephew is one of my best friends. Is that what I'm gonna be like when I'm that age? And I just said, ah, oh, I, 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 I gotta change. Yeah. I, I can tell you exactly what desk I was sitting at, uh, <clears throat> what desk he was sitting at, the type of day it was. Uh, an epiphany is not something that you, you uh, use as a description. It is an actual act. It, it's like an opening of the heavens or of the earth otherwise. Uh, it, it's something that really should impact your thinking. And, and from there then, is that where you sort of, your mindset shifted and you use the words, I'm gonna use your word that you just said there, there now, um, own the customer, not the center. Is that where that mindset shifted? And sort no, of that uh, but that shifted in our first company, um, uh, uh, 
I had had a, a, a lot of apartment buildings uh, uh, that I had owned uh, in that I invested in uh, in the seventies, and I didn't like uh, the residential income business. Uh, it was uh, kind of I just wasn't me. Uh, so I wanted to to go into commercial real estate, uh, and the best way to do so uh, was land banking. I come from an old ranching and farming family here in California, and so. Uh, that land meant something to me. So we started off as uh, land banking and building small buildings on very high quality, large uh, pieces of property on the edge of master plan commercial developments throughout the, the Southwest, uh, California, Arizona, and Texas. Um, and we would put the smallest building possible, on uh, the biggest piece of dirt we could afford where we had an excess entitlement. So basically I'd build a 50,000 foot building on a larger piece of land than necessary, just the opposite of what most people would do. Uh, but I had 500,000 feet of rights to build. And my plan was uh, like any good old farmer, you know, sit on the land until they want to come build houses. So I was growing vegetables in my mind, uh, waiting for the right timing, which we put a 10 year cycle on this company. Uh, and, uh, we built uh, uh, quite a number of projects across the Southwest and we're the first company in our industry to, to run that kind of business plan. Uh, and it was quite successful and, and we sold it. Uh, uh, so we went from that, uh, uh, which was a very asset intensive, um, positive balance sheet company to an operating model where we would lease space, subdivide that space um, uh, and then put it into uh, the business center operating format. And the bigger we got, uh, the more terrified I became uh, because our leasehold liabilities uh, and a lease is a debt instrument when you think about it, uh, it is today in accounting world. Uh, so uh, we had uh, uh, basically a 10 or 12 to one ratio of revenue to debt uh, which if you think of a balance sheet and the value, way you value a business, that's not a good balance sheet, uh, even though the business is a good cash flow business. Uh, the ratios are, and that suppressed the value. And uh, so I started worrying about that and deciding there had to be a better business model. And this is in the late 90s. And the concept of just-in-time real estate and uh, all, all of the technology that was developing during the dot-com era, including Expedia. Um, some guys out of Microsoft started that. And um, a friend of mine had a hotel management group, uh, a, a, a fellow by the name of John Davis had Pegasus, which is the back end of the hotel industry. So I kind of figured out that uh, we could build a back end, uh, a wholesale structure within commercial real estate. And so we, when we sold our portfolio uh, in uh, 2000, uh, the other two partners went away and retired and I bought their interests out of the remaining during the company, which was tiny at that time, uh, and uh, started off on another in, in the direction that we're going today. Wow, it's, so, it's a, lot, a lot there, yeah. It's evolved <laughs> quite a bit, right? Well, it, it, it a lot of evolution, but no pivoting. Right. Uh, we, we, we always went forward. And I think one of the things that I go back to racing yachts and, and, and that sort of thing is you, you always know your, your starting point, you know where you're supposed to end up at the finish line. Um, but just because you're changing course and adjusting to the weather, adjusting the currents and the tides, doesn't mean you're pivoting. It means you're adjusting to the conditions around you. And it might be another competitive racer uh, you might be match racing and, and trying to beat that particular person rather than just winning the race, uh, or you might uh, uh, be going for the finish line. Uh, so a lot of different strategies that occur, and, but the whole thing is know where you're going to finish, know where you want to get to, uh, and then go as fast as you can. And using sailing again, uh, when you turn a rudder on a ship, you're really breaking the ship. You're, mm -hmm. it, it slows the ship down. And so whoever can steer the least or can learn to steer with the sails rather than the rudder uh, goes faster. Mm. Uh, so we've tried to uh, have good strategies, uh, have good core business structures, and then let the market 
and react to the market conditions and not oversteer the ship, so to speak. Mm. Now, obviously, you've been in that market for a number of years and you've seen the evolution of, of the co-working service to office mm -hmm. um, executive suites. Um, how has your customer changed? Has the demands changed and how has it sort of altered your product delivery? delivery? The customer has changed. Um, uh, the, the core requirements of the customer have not changed. Uh, everybody wants quality service. Uh, everybody wants uh, more technology than they can get on their own and you can accomplish in a shared environment. Uh, and everybody wants uh, a good location that's well maintained. So the, the basics of the business haven't changed. What's changed a lot is the acceptance. Uh, we used to have to explain what flexible workspace was. Uh, today, uh, we have to fight off everybody trying to redefine it a hundred different ways. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so... Uh, it, it has a very much, it's a very much a mainstream product now, and that's uh, nice to see. Uh, what's changed in that regard um, are, is the input from very large organizations. Uh, most people think uh, that uh, uh, the business center and co-working industry is for small entrepreneurial companies. The reality is probably 50% overall of the uh, occupants within uh, business and co-working centers today come from government and the Fortune 1000. Uh, and they are massively migrating in our direction, particularly as they change the employment structure they're using and go from an employer to a, a contractor, uh, a model, uh, and distributing their workforce on a global basis to where it matters little where one sits today, so long as one sits on the web or on the, with enough bandwidth. Uh, you're sitting somewhere, I'm sitting somewhere, your audience is scattered everywhere. Uh, place is becoming less and less important. Yeah, no, and technology is that factor that actually uh, allows everything to take place, right? Um, so whenever you're thinking about the locations and you talked about the different types of companies or government or entrepreneurs who may be interested in your site, how do you evaluate the type of business that will be operating whenever you've got to go build, you know, invest, sign a lease, design? How do you evaluate those needs? Well, there are a lot of... Uh, um, I've used the analogy of the automotive industry in the past, uh, and I'll, I'll use it here in, in that regard. Um, a basic automobile is a basic automobile. There's a chassis, four wheels, an engine, and a steering wheel, and it moves people around. But models change. So we used to have station wagons. We Now we have SUVs. What's an SUV? It's a station wagon with more suspension. Right. Okay. Uh, we used to have minivans everywhere. We still do. Uh, that replaced station wagons too. Uh, sports cars. We still have sports cars. Uh, but what are we doing? Oh, we're electrifying them. Uh, so the models evolve, but we're still driving cars. Oh, we're not going to drive cars in a while. They're going to be autonomous. Still a car. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, when we look at real estate, there are certain basic things that people need. It, it's sort of like, you know, uh, we all have to have food and shelter, right? Uh, real estate comes into the shelter category. It's the place, one of the places today that you do uh, business from. Um, but the services that come along with it and how those services are developed or how the business model is delivered. You used to have to buy your own property. Then you used to lease it long term and become responsible for all of its maintenance and management. Then you leased it shorter term on a full service gross basis. And now you're using it as needed. And it's really followed the structure of a just in time inventory and the intermodal system development, uh, the way things are, are created today. Uh, I don't know if you think about this in a good or a bad way, but the average city in the United States has a food supply that will last three days. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's kind of a scary thing if you're in a hurricane zone. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, it's a very good thing. Everything's fresher, everything's cheaper, everything. There's no wastage. So all of those positives are why we, we, we go to the just-in-time model. Mm -hmm. And real estate today is delivered that way. Uh, also, um, uh, looks like you're working from your home. 
yeah. I'm, uh, it's Friday, so I am definitely working from my home, and I won't be working at all after lunch. Uh, uh, but uh, we work from a number of locations uh, uh, today. Um, I have a business lunch today. Uh, I had a conference call this morning with our offices over in London. Um, uh, yesterday, I was traveling. So, I mean, we, we move around and do business from three or four places. So, again, the, the physical place is less important as the convenience and the productivity of it. And that revolves a lot about around the technologies that we use. Uh, so you don't want to tie up your resources with a lot of expensive permanent space. It, it's mm -hmm. a waste of your resources today in, in today's world. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, with that, the shift in the term, right? And and I know in the UK, right, where I've come there, I mean, it was very normal to do 25, 30 year leases yeah. with that sort of reducing and, and sort of uh, a lot shorter term basis to your points. How then do you think um, co working providers, serviced office providers, in the service that they're providing to the uh, enterprise type of client or the government client, mm -hmm. is the term changing in a sense of the duration of the term? Is are are they those companies looking for longer term deals or serviced offices looking for longer term contracts with um, it, those it, vendors? It's mixing out uh, in the serviced office industry, uh, the flexible workplace industry, co working, any label you want to put on it. Um, the original term that we started with in 1980 was one month, three months, six months, one year. And that pretty much lived through the early 2000s. Uh, today, um, uh, we use uh, travel cards to go between centers. Uh, we might have a one, a month to month travel card agreement, but it gives us access to 50 business locations. Um, uh, that's a, an example of a totally different kind of term. What's your term? Uh, I think it was an hour and a half today. Uh, I had to be on this side of town using one location on another side of town using another location. And I have the right to do so because I purchased a subscription to a, a business travel card of some sort. Um, so that has definitely changed. And one of the biggest consumers of those types of services um, uh, uh, is the, uh, uh, the large corporations. Uh, and I'll use uh, Regis uh, and their business world card as a good example of that. Um, they're one of our major competitors, but they're also an excellent company that we know very well and, and enjoy a great relationship with their senior management. Uh, so I'll, I'll plug them instead of us. Uh, uh, but uh, their business world card, the primary user of that is not a small entrepreneur, but it's the large corporate user. It's a travel a lot. Uh, that's a perfect example of, the, uh, of an extreme change in term. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that that would probably see about as short as, as as you can see it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I often wonder, you know, because it's you know, uh, whenever I'm negotiating, you know, contracts with um, serviced offices, typically I like it because of the flexibility. It's short term. It's, it's, it's it is that short term commitment that is appealing. But uh, you know, it's also very stable. No, so, no, absolutely, you know, absolutely. So you can be there as long as you yeah. want. Uh, and it, it's funny in. in 20 years ago, uh, people would say, well, what do you need in business? And the first thing you say, well, let's see, you have to have a, a product that customers want. Uh, you have to have access to capital. That's what you need. Today, you have to have a product, access to capital, and flexibility. If you don't have flexibility, you cannot react fast enough to changes in market conditions. Mm. And that's one of the things that our industry delivers but we also deliver a high degree of flexibility with a tremendous sense of permanence, which is a little contradictory, but it's sort of like, hey, Steve, we're going to be there when you need us for as long as you need us, whether it's a day or 10 years, we're going to be there. So we're perm our permanence gives you flexibility as an industry. Right. And that's a very good exchange. Nice. The other thing that we do as an industry uh, on a center by center or brand by brand basis is we uh, add a sense of community. So uh, you might be an independent contractor working for a large company in a, uh, a remote area, 
But when you walk into the office, everybody's going to say, hey, Steve, hey, what's up? You know, how about those Dodgers or whatever? Uh, you, you, <laughs> you're you're going to have a sense of community. And in some cases, when the center takes on a heightened um, a social responsibility by supporting a charity or, or, or something of that nature, you'll also find a, a, a very valid purpose behind the community that's more than just social and business. Yeah. Uh, so that's an element that our industry has brought uh, that's a, a quite rewarding for everybody. Uh, I think the industry has, absolutely. I know whenever I sort of evaluating, should we build a smaller, small corporate office that can hire you know, six to 10 people while we can create that, actually providing it within a part of a serviced office, you actually put those six to 10 people into a community space. So they have a social interaction, the ability to, to exchange and, and uh, meet with well, other people. It, it really, it really if, if you go to some of our world's problems today, uh, and we, uh, everybody talks about climate change and, and energy and, and things of that nature. Um, <sighs> Just the, the, the statement you made, building a place for six or eight people. Well, you know, now all those people have to go from wherever they live to that place. And the very best person you might want to hire might not live near that place. So maybe they think I'm going to get a different job instead of work for Steve. Or maybe they burn out because they have an hour commute, but we know that they're wasting energy no matter what. Now you can create the same structure by getting six independent virtual and or serviced offices that are near to your clients or near to the people's homes, link them up with technology, lose nothing in the sense of culture and community and virtually save the planet. So if you want to go to that type of an extreme as well, or in our case, we have our executive team is, is literally spread all over the world. Uh, yet we're still able to meet three or four times a week as a full team because of technology. We don't like moving people. Uh, one of our, our uh, key C-level uh, officers uh, lives in uh, uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Well, there's not much in Lexington except the Kentucky Derby and a lot of horses and farmland. He likes horses and farmland why would I want him to have to move to California and try and get him to like surfers and the beach? You know, that's not who he is. So he'd be miserable here. Uh, his cost of living would be two or three times higher here. Uh, so I, and he would have to be, leave his family. So again, our industry solves a lot of that problem, uh, the type of problem as well. You can hire the best people, keep them in place where their family is, where they're entrenched and still, provide a proper work environment for everybody. Yeah, no, absolutely. And now with this evolution of technology, right, we get better access to data. We can get so much deeper into, into understanding the interactions of people, what they do, how they do things. How has technology and data specifically impacted your business and how you approach your business? Well, we're, we're kind of data freaks. Uh, we, we actually have a mantra in the company that says, get the data. Uh, data becomes information which converts to knowledge, which you can turn into action. So get the data. And everybody's sick of hearing that, but it's true. Uh, uh, we, 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 we really run our company and uh, certainly run all of our marketing and sales off of a very, very tight data set. And it's reviewed daily uh, by the senior team. We look at our numbers in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <clears throat> I, I, I can't stress that enough for any company. In fact, one of the small things that when you look at companies and, and I'll, I'll ask you the question, uh, you have a web driven company in, in many respects. Uh, when you sit down and look at your financials, do you look at your analytics, your web analytics at the same time or before you look at your financials? And you don't have to answer that. You don't no, have no, to no, 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 no. It's, it's, no, it's at this moment, it's, it's web analytics. Absolutely. It you is know. the data and it's the data. It's, it's all it's about where do people go? What are they interested in? Where are they coming from? And, and, what yeah. and it drives your financials. So most people look at them with two separate teams and two separate times. And you really have to look at that one set of data that comes out of your web analytics as a driver to your financials uh, and, and coalesce the two of those together. Um, as a single activity rather than as two separate activities. So data driven 
business decision making uh, is 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 critical uh, yeah. to, to us. And I think is be because of the way we can gather data today, um, uh, it it should be a, a critical part of everybody's activities. No, I totally totally agree. And uh, yeah, I think uh, data, data just tells a different story, right? We all have assumptions. We all have you know. Uh, views, gut feelings, but data just cuts right through it all. I love it. Um, so you're a serial entrepreneur. Uh, you have invested in, and created um, the Brian Alliance. Um, now, whenever you think about the future of work, how, and you've talked about how we're probably going to likely move to more freelance model contractor based, what other things and opportunities are you looking for? Or do you look for as you think about that model going forward? Well, what we think that place will become much less important. Uh, uh, overall. Um, and we think that uh, such things as augmented and virtual reality will become much more important uh, in business in the way we do. Um, today, uh, you and I are sitting uh, separately in, in our individual offices. Um, uh, we could be using a HoloLens system and be sitting in the same place and having this sitting around in, in, in the same environment uh, virtually. And we're going to see much more of that in business uh, uh, as it progresses. We're also going to see uh, the ability to uh, use virtual reality in the same way that gaming systems use it, uh, where we put on a, a, a device, uh, it could be a headset or a, a, a glasses set, uh, uh, and uh, we conduct all of our business through that virtual structure uh, in much the same way that uh, gaming works today. And there are a lot of, um, I would say a lot, there are a number of uh, companies and some of the largest gaming companies that are looking at their next generation of product beyond gaming and uh, the creating virtual office environments and virtual environments overall, but specifically virtual office environments is uh, one of those things. And if you think about it, um, why would I bother to get a thousand square foot office overlooking Central Park in New York uh, and pay for that if I could slip on a headset and virtually have the same thing in the Bronx? I wouldn't. No, so, no, no. It, 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 so, so what you'll see as this evolves, which will start in 2022, 23, um, uh, as this evolves and becomes a, a ubiquitous form of officing within 10 years after that, a complete repurposing of commercial real estate and a, a, a reorganizing of the way cities are, are, are set up uh, today, where we live in one building and work in a different building and, and, and maybe commute in and out of, of town, um, we'll be able to create much more residential space from repurposed commercial space because instead of me needing a thousand square foot office, I'm really happy to sit in a 64 uh, square foot cube as long as I have my access to my technology through uh, my office through the technology that's available. Mm. Um, mm. So uh, everything will get much more efficient. Uh, transportation requirements will be reduced. Housing stock will be able to be freed up as a result of this change. It'll be somewhat tectonic as, as, as it relates to the structure of cities. So do you anticipate that some sort of erosion of your core business whenever that comes? And I'm understanding it's 2022. We don't really know what that, how long that will take to sort of uh, bear fruit, to sort of speak at mass, to sort of impact. Well, to, to, to me, no. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we're investing in prop tech companies and uh, so we are a technology company today, uh, more than anything else, and an investment group. And um, so from our business, no, uh, we'll be managing what used to be called occupiers of space. That was the, the real estate term. You were an occupier. Um, we have been referring to them for the last five or six years as travelers, uh, and we'll be managing travelers and the way they utilize space for work purposes the same way that travelers are managed for uh, mobility purposes. Uh, that's one shift that's going on right now that we're investing in systems to do that. Uh, the other thing that, that we see is uh, as virtual reality, uh, virtual reality offices, I should say, 
as virtual reality offices come into being. Uh, we're already speaking and, and working with a couple of larger companies in that area as well. Uh, so we will migrate. We migrated from a property company focused on land to an operating company focused on facilities. We're a business services and technology company today focused on investment and the investments we're making are for uh, prop tech management in the future on a technology basis. No, that's uh, great. Our, our next 10 years. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's the total evolution. And now obviously whenever that evolves, um, how do you think it's going to impact workplace productivity? Oh, tremendously, tremendously. I think uh, not just uh, productivity, uh, but satisfaction. Uh, you know, uh, all you have to do is get on a commuter train in any major city in the world at 6.30 or 6 or 5.30 in the morning and look around and see how happy people are. They're just excited as heck. Uh, okay, no, they're not. Uh, but it's really nice to roll into your local office that's just across town or just across the street or maybe even one day or two days a week like I work out of my house uh, at uh, the normal time, dressed in your normal work mode, uh, but not having to face uh, anything but being your most productive self. And you can realign your time uh, for your, your work, be much more productive, uh, and also for your family and that's what it's all about. I mean, uh, my, my dad, who I respected an awful lot, uh, used to say or said once when we were talking about work when I was young, he said, well, work is like being in the old days of the cavemen. Uh, work is like going out and killing mastodons and dragging them home. Uh, it's just life is singing songs and making paintings on the cave walls. Yeah, That's what life's about. It, it's not the work. You, you work so that you can have the life and, and you, you have to find that balance. And I think the new technology, uh, the new officing structures, the new hiring structures, the big battle today in the corporate world is for talent. Guess what? If you don't have a flexible workplace program, you can't get the talent today. They won't come to work for you. Uh, so all of this change that's going on uh, is, I think, very good uh, for, for all productivity uh, overall, not just work productivity. Yeah. No, and as someone who sits in those trains uh, three days a week, I totally uh, buy into everything. You said. <laughs> 90 minutes there, 90 minutes back. It, it takes a lot. The, the yeah. days I, I do yeah. operate from home, it's so much more productive. It yeah. really is. It's frightening how much, actually. And, and my dog likes it better, too. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so again, the other side of open source workplaces, thinking about workplace experience, employee experiences with these technologies and the shift, how do you how do you see that changing? Mm, say that again. I, I, so I'm, it, with the shift of technologies and, and obviously the people less interactive and being in the same building, companies maybe being a little more diverse spread, you know, workplace experience could be somewhat different or the employee experience of being with an organization can be somewhat different. Well, I, I, I think that depending on how the technology is used uh, will be the outcome of that. Uh, uh, the advances in technology that we're seeing today allow us to uh, move through space and time much more effectively. Um, uh, so uh, I don't think we'll be as um, uh, isolated from each other as you might be suggesting. Mm. Uh, uh, certainly, I don't feel isolated from my team, even though we're operating across multitude of time zones. Uh, uh, we're used to it. Uh, as a company, we've functionally been paperless since the early 90s. We, we went pure tech before tech existed and said, no, we, we don't have to do these things. I don't want to have... Putting file cabinets in office space is very expensive. Yeah, it is. Okay, that, that's a, you know, and when you look around, you say, "Oh, that's the most expensive warehouse space in the world." Where, where, is, where is it? Oh, it's on Fifth Avenue. Right. Uh, you know, it's on Palm Mall. Uh, you know, it, it, it very, very expensive uh, storage space. So, uh, uh, you can do all these things if you just look around you and see what are what are the options. Uh, yeah. But I don't think we'll 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 lose connectivity. I think we'll actually gain it. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have to write a letter post it, and then wait for a reply. Uh, so has technology made me more or less connected? Right. Um, I used to have to, in fact, I had a video system in the early 80s. 
Okay, but it cost me about $150 an hour to run, and it cost about $50,000 to install per int. Okay, and then I had to have an operator come in and run it because I couldn't figure out how. Has the technology we're using right now uh, done anything but bring us closer together? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you get a bunch of phone zombies walking down the street and, and, and <laughs> not paying attention to anything, that's a, a different story. But the, the, the what we use to interact is only getting better. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 great. Um, yeah, look, Frank, look, I want to appreciate I appreciate your time. Um, and I want to thank you for your your insights um, and, and sharing some of your your views. And it's really great to see that the evolution um, that's taken place and, and what you're sort of working on and where you're also you're aspiring to go with your organization um, and shifting from actual physical real estate to a technology software based company. So. Um, thank you once again for taking the time to chat with us. Um, so if you enjoyed this video, uh, click the like, subscribe. And as I said, as we said before, if there's something here that sort of sparked an interest to you or a question, um, put it in the comments below and uh, we'll be sure to monitor and uh, get back to you and, and, and sort of try and answer your questions as best we can. So uh, for now, thank you and uh, take care. Thanks, Steve.